I think we have uh, come together with some common interest that is comparative literature and world literature. Uh, so far as I can see, I, I'm, I'm always thinking of world literature as part of comparative literature. Comparative literature has always been uh, trying to study literature beyond the natural, national boundary from the very beginning. And of course, comparative literature um, has been uh, a discipline since the late 19th century. And now when we talk about world literature, we also, also uh, sooner or later, we always talk about uh, Goethe uh, in the beginning of 19th century, to be precise, is 1827, when he talked with his young secretary, uh, Johann Peter Eckermann, about world literature, and what the idea of that literature. Uh, but of course, he has also written some other essays and letters talking about the same concept. But the most famous one, of course, was the conversation we had uh, very precisely on the last day of January, January 31st, uh, as Eggman's uh, conversation with Goethe recorded. He talked about uh, the idea of world literature. When Goethe talked about the idea of world literature, he was reading a Chinese novel in translation. And that is very significant because <coughs> Eggman uh, thought the Chinese novel must be, I mean, for early 19th century in Europe, must be very strange. I mean, why Goethe was reading a Chinese novel? Because Goethe himself uh, was consciously an inheritor of the Greek Roman tradition. He considered himself as a classic, uh, you know, in the classical tradition. He was very familiar with uh, European literature. So Eggman uh, asked him why you are reading this. It's very strange. But then Goethe talked about his reading experience, and he said the Chinese actually just like us. I mean, like Germans, <laughs> we feel the same. We have the same feeling as well. Of course, on the one hand, uh, the novel was a very foreign one, very different from uh, European literature he was familiar with. Particularly, he was comparing the Chinese novel with the um, uh, poetry by the French poet Béranger, because he just read Béranger uh, earlier, and he was comparing them, and particularly comparing them uh, in terms of morality. He saw that the French poetry was very erotic, almost as they lit it, uh, some kind of uh, you know, um, uh, erotic motif. Uh, but the Chinese, he saw the novel, even though it was describing a young man and a young woman, but it's very proper. He said the Chinese did everything very proper, very uh, decorous, and so on. But anyway, he said the Chinese are just like us. So uh, in reading this Chinese novel, but unfortunately he didn't mention the title, so we don't really know exactly which one. But there are many uh, scholars have discussed this, and uh, most of the uh, basic consensus is a Ming Dynasty novel of the 16th century. Um, it's not exactly the best Chinese novel, I must say, the greater ones, but of course, such things sometimes happen almost by accident. That novel was translated into French by a Jesuit missionary. And in those days, Jesuit missionaries are very, very influential. They report about China, they translate Chinese texts into uh, French or Latin or Italian or Portuguese, actually. <coughs> but uh, um, so they had a tremendous influence. And Goethe was reading the Chinese novel. Uh, so there are two things very important when he talked about the very famous conversation with Eckerman, he said, national literature now is meaningless. Um, and the time, the epoch for world literature is here, and every one of us should promote the coming of world literature. It's a very famous remark Goethe made. So there are two important things about the, the idea of world literature. One is that he was reading a Chinese novel in translation. In other words, he was reading not a European work, but a non-European one and also was reading in translation, not in the original. So these two things are very different from later, the discipline as comparative which was set up in uh, in 19th century, particularly in French uh, scholarship, because um, you know, as the International Comparative Literature Association was actually registered in Paris as an organization, was very much influenced by French scholarship. And of course, 19th century was also the time of positivism. So uh, the French idea of uh, literature comparée, 
was very much influenced by the idea of positivistic connections, what uh, Jean Carré called the habeau de fait. You must establish actual factual uh, evidence of the contact of different authors and works. So the idea is what later was called the influence study. So you have to re read, you have to establish to authors who has read what and influenced by the readings and so on. And of course that has made great contribution to the reception of works, the history of publishing uh, and many other things. So uh, it's um, historical or biographical studies of authors and works <coughs> and had a great contribution. But the 19th century uh, was also the time of European expansion to other parts of the world. So for many European scholars, it's unthinkable that you know, other cultures, non-European cultures, could have literature. Uh, therefore, the idea of East-West comparative study was just impossible at that time. Um, <clears throat> and the first journal of comparative literature, the editor, um, um, Hugo von uh, Metzo was the editor of the first journal, and he came up with this idea of Descartes. He was a German-speaking um, uh, scholar born in Hungary at the time. Of course, at that time was the Austrian-Hungarian Hungarian Empire, and he was a German-speaking Hungarian scholar, and therefore he proposed the idea of Descartes, the ten languages. The ten, ten languages are all European languages. Of course, it's very impressive for any scholar to have really perfect command of ten languages. It's not a, not, not a uh, simple achievement. Um, but even so, it still shows a, a kind of limitation that is all European languages. It's impossible to cross over from European to non-European languages. <coughs> so, in other words, comparative literature when it started in 19th century was very different from Goethe's idea of literature, because on one hand, uh, Goethe was reading um, a Chinese novel and in translation, and two of the things, you know, for earlier comparative literature, and, and I think this from the uh, rigorous point of view, I mean, in the scholarship is very rigorous, you must work with original languages. You cannot read in translation. So what Goethe was doing, reading a Chinese novel in translation, would be very different from what comparative literature should be doing, uh, according to uh, Melzo's idea. Um, <clears throat> so, comparative literature started in 19th century and for much of 19th, for, for not only 19th century, but I say for much of 20th century, still uh, is very much a Eurocentric idea. When I say Eurocentric, I do not necessarily mean it's just a critical term, just a cri uh, criticizing the Eurocentric idea. Because, as I said, you know, from a linguistic point of view, very rigorous requirement to work with the original text is very strong in comparative literature, and that is very important. And indeed, many of the important works in comparative literature, the classics, we, we can think of Irish Albach's Mimesis, we can think of Robert uh, Ernst Curtius, European Literature and Latin Middle Ages, we can think of Northrop North Fry, his Anatomy of Criticism, we can think of the even more uh, recent critics like Frank Kermode, his sense of ending a great work for the study of novels and narratology. We can think of Ombud um, Eco. You know, all these great scholars, um, their works are wonderful and has tremendous influence in um, the study of comparative literature, but they're all talking about Western literature. Mm -hmm. None of these talk about anything outside West. Now, when I say this, it, I don't mean this as a criticism, because they are very rigorous in their scholarship. They always talk about what uh, the literature they really know. They know in the original. The same is true with philosophers, actually. <clears throat> in uh, the uh, 1984, or 85, 1984, I think, at that time I was studying, at, uh, studying comparative literature at Harvard, and Hans Georg Gadamer, the great German philosopher, uh, which I admire very much, and I like his work very much. I read his Truth and Method. So I wrote to, a letter to him, and I said I wanted to you know, meet him. 
Uh, and after almost a month, I didn't get a reply. I said, you know, this is a great philosopher who, cannot, who couldn't care about you know, the, ch the Chinese student. <laughs> but actually, <coughs> later, Gadamer wrote to me in handwriting German, a small letter. I was, you know, he says, uh, uh, I'm sorry that your letter is uh, uh, you know, underneath a pile of books on my table. And he said, I didn't really <laughs> discover that until now. And he wrote to me and he said, that's a curse of old age. It's a very good excuse. <laughs> but anyway, he invited me to have a conversation with him. I had a, actually one afternoon talking with Gadamer uh, in his uh, residence. In, uh, at that time, he was lecturing in Boston College, not far from Harvard. So I drove from Harvard to Boston College, and I met him. And I had a very, very nice conversation with him. I really liked him very much. I admired his work. And of course, you know, this is a kind of uh, personal experience story maybe you would be interested in. It's also relevant to what I was talking earlier about the um, kind of, you know, scholarship. Uh, when I went in, uh, Gadamer asked me, uh, Mr. Zhang, do you like tea or coffee? <laughs> <laughs> and then we started talking very naturally about tea and coffee. Tea, of course, is Chinese, original, uh, from China. Um, actually, the word tea, uh, it's from French called Te, actually it's a uh, southern pronunciation in China, but northern pronunciation is Cha, so mm. in Chinese we call it Cha, it's not tea. Mm. But Russian, you know, because they are, they are in north of China, the Russian word for Chinese tea is called Chai, exactly the same pronunciation as the northern pronunciation. Of China. In Portuguese it's Cha. Cha, okay, so that's yeah. the same. Yeah. That's the real, real Chinese pron the Mandarin pronunciation, it's called Cha. So we started very naturally talking about cha, uh, cha and, and uh, coffee. You know, coffee is Western, uh, tea is Chinese. So we started talking about this. And I, I told uh, Gadamer I was very interested in hermeneutics in his theory. Uh, and he talked about his uh, teacher, Heidegger. He said Heidegger actually tried to learn Chinese. But after maybe three months or even less, and he gave, gave up because it's too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Garner says he didn't even try. <laughs> he knew it's too difficult. So that's why he said, <coughs> uh, he, uh, because I told him many of the ideas in hermeneutics was very, very close to what Chinese tradition had the same ideas. But he said uh, he didn't talk about China because he didn't know the Chinese language. And therefore, he restrict, restricted himself to talk about the Western tradition. And of course, his Greek and Latin was great. He was a classicist. Um, so that is the same idea that many of the great scholars in Europe and the West, they don't talk about the West, uh, don't talk about the, uh, talk about the East, because they uh, are very rigorous in their scholarship. They don't want to talk about something they don't know. So that's good. But by the same token, they are also limited. Mm. You know, uh, when I read Nosa Fry, when I read uh, Umberto Eco, when I read many other. Uh, great works in comparative literature and work literature. Uh, you know, many of the ideas has so many uh, associations, affinities with Eastern Chinese or um, other non-Western cultures and literatures, but they, they don't talk about this. I think that's something I very much want to do and try to um, make the study of comparative literature and work literature really uh, expand to cover the world as we talk about world literature, if, if we are serious about world literature, it's not literature of Europe. It has to be a literature of the whole world that's expand beyond European traditions. Um, so this is very important for me. Um, the <coughs> comparative literature, um, in, particularly in America, in late uh, 20th century, because I was in America for a very long time, I taught I, I got my PhD at Harvard and I taught in California for almost ten, 10 years before I went to Hong Kong. So I'm very familiar with uh, particularly American scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching comparative literature and, and literary theory. And I never taught Chinese in, in, in America. So um, I'm quite familiar with um, Western scholarship, particularly in America. And I must say, in, uh, in, uh, in 1980s and 1990s, uh, that was a time of literary theory. Literary theory was a rage, you know. Uh, everybody was talking about literary theory, and particularly graduate students read about literary theory of different theoretical approaches, you know, uh, 
you can think of in earlier time, of course, is new criticism, and then Russian formalism, structuralism, uh, social linguistics, and you read, you read uh, Levi Strauss, you read Von Barth, you read uh, all these great uh, structural um, uh, literary theories. And then, of course, there is post structuralism. You read Derrida, you read Foucault, you read late, uh, later um, uh, Von Barth and uh, Julia Kristeva, and so on. But then you don't read literature, and that's a problem. In seven, 1980s and 1990s, literary theory become more and more abstract, more and more <laughs> philosophical, and people talk about more about philosophy than literature. And that became a problem in 20, uh, 2006, I think, about almost more than 10 years ago. You know, every 10 years, the American Comparative Literature Association will have a report about the status of the field and also discuss the future. And in, I remember in 2006, that was uh, the report coming out of the Comparative Literature Association. And I was invited uh, along with um, um, Linda Hutchin from Toronto and also German Color from Cornell and myself. Three of us were given the comment on the new report. <coughs> And I, I, I think the report is very, very important. And the major uh, text was prepared by Hong Sosi. He's now in Chicago. And he uh, pointed out very, <coughs> very clearly and very strongly, he said, and in a, in a very ironic way, more humorous way, he said, uh, for a theoretical linguist, uh, you can talk about different languages without really speaking any foreign language. You can write about language in English only. You can talk about you know, the theory of linguistics without really learning many foreign languages. But he said, for the last few decades, you can also have a career in literary studies without talking about literature, <laughs> you know, without sustained, sustained reference to literature. And that is a problem. So many um, comparatists, many people have realized this problem. And some of them, of course, were considered um, older generation, considered uh, conservative. But Honsosi is a younger prof uh, a professor, a younger scholar. We all feel the same. Uh, you can think of, uh, for example, a very famous biblical scholar <coughs> in uh, <coughs> Berkeley. Uh, what's his name? Alter, Robert Alter, has a book called Re uh, uh, Reading, uh, Reading in the Age of uh, something. I can't remember uh, the, t the title. But he's very critical of the theoretical development that becomes, um, you know, moving away, literary studies moving away from literature. And of course, um, uh, Avram Cannon is a, also a famous professor from Yale, uh, has this famous book that he entitled Death of Literature. There are many other uh, discussions like this. Frank Comer himself also, uh, in his late age, uh, when he was giving the um, Tanner Lectures, I think in Berkeley, uh, he chose the title, can, uh, the book of, of his lectures is called Change, Pleasure and Change uh, on the canon. Of course, by that time, canon becomes also almost a taboo. Nobody talks about canon anymore. When you talk about canon, it's also often considered very conservative. Of course, uh, Howard Bloom has this Western canon <laughs> <laughs> representing a very uh, sort of uh, conservative position. But canon is important. You know. uh, there was a time in America uh, scholarship of decanonization, get rid of canon. But actually when you look at the, the argument, it's not really get rid of canon as such, but it's replacing old canon with some new works, particularly in uh, feminist studies and post-colonial studies. Replace, for example, uh, should you teach T.S. Eliot or you, uh, teach uh, Morrison, you know, a, a, a black uh, of a female writer, a uh, great writer. Uh, so, so things like this. So it's not really get rid of canon, but replace some of the older canon with newer works. Uh, so the canon is actually important. The value judgment of literature is important because after all, if we have endless time, you can read all the works, uh, whatever work you want to read. But then the fact is we are all limited in our lifespan. You know, time is limited is pressure, precious. Therefore, you must use your time to do the best, to read the best works. That's my um, 
<laughs> also the idea of how you spend your time. And canonical works are the works that have withstood the test of time. Uh, tend to be greater works with greater values. And it's not decided by one person, it's not decided by um, a particular time, because many of the canonical works have withstood time and become relevant to different readers under different political, cultural, historical conditions. So this is what we uh, want to emphasize. So um, given the condition of the uh, late 20th century development, literary theory became predominant and gradually cultural studies replaced literary studies. Many students, many uh, departments have programs called cultural studies, no longer literary studies. You know, this is very clearly reflected in Frank Kermode's uh, debate with uh, uh, John Guillory when he gave the Tanner Lectures. You know, Tanner Lectures, uh, after the lecture, there are four uh, respondents, mm -hmm. and they will respond to the lecture, and the, um, uh, the lecturer would have a chance to um, reply. And uh, I would recommend very strongly to read Frank Kermode's uh, Pleasure and Change uh, on the canon, and that is his lecture. In, uh, in Berkeley, and he, one of the respondents was John Guillory, who is famous for cultural studies. <coughs> and that, that big change is very, um, both of them uh, were not missing their words, so to speak, very direct, and talking about um, pleasure and uh, aesthetic values and literary values and canonical and so on. So, in any case, I think the rise of world literature in the last decade or so. Uh, was in, in, in one way a response to the situation, uh, as reported in the um, uh, American Comparative Literature Association's report uh, 10 years ago. That is, we should come back to reading of literature. We should discuss literariness, and so on. <coughs> I think work literature becomes very much popular, uh, is one of the reasons is that uh, you know, it coming back to read literary works, discuss literature as such. Because after all, most of us come to the study of literature because of our love of literature. Who doesn't like to read a good poem, a wonderful novel, a, a good play, and so on. So I think that's a very natural uh, um, desire. And the rise of world literature is, in a way, responding to that. Um, the other... Um, reason I think world literature is getting uh, very popular now is because we are living in a very much connected, global, uh, globalized world. Uh, you know, no matter where you are, you know, in, in Brazil, in China, or in Europe, in America, uh, you always, um, you know, in your daily life even, uh, you would have contact or ideas about other cultures. It's almost impossible to live in a very isolated way. Uh, so uh, technology, digital communication, made the world much smaller uh, in a way. Uh, and, and when we read an email, you, you don't know that where the email comes from. You know, anybody can be anywhere, anytime. Uh, so communication becomes very, very easy and um, very different from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So in a way, uh, what literature is also a reflection of the change of the world particularly since the um, late 1980s, you know, the, the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Berlin Wall would be a very iconic, uh, symbolic uh, image of the, um, the connected world, uh, no longer separate uh, from, uh, from the other side. So uh, what literature, I think, in, in, in a way, is a cultural, literary um, symmetrum of that situation of globalized connection of the world we now uh, are living in. Um, so, um, but what is literature? What is world literature? I think we still want to discuss the question. Uh, of course, David Damrush has written a book entitled What is World Literature? <laughs> <laughs> and he became very influential and famous because of this. And of course, David is, uh, is a very good friend of mine. Uh, uh, so, um, I think his, I, his book became so influential and famous because he offered a definition of world literature that makes sense. Because as Claudio Vienne argues, 
what literature doesn't make sense. No. How can you how can you read whole what literature? Nobody can read what literature. Whatever you read, how much you can read, uh, would still be a very tiny part of literature produced in the world. So Franco Moretti says reading more is not an answer. It has to be different, and categories have to be different. Uh, so in a way. Um, World literature cannot be literally understood. It's not all the works of literature produced in the world, in all languages, in all cultures, because it's too many. There's too much uh, unmanageable <coughs> amount of work. <coughs> so David Demarsh's definition is that a work that has circulates beyond its culture of origin becomes part of world literature. So in that sense, then, uh, a work of literature, no matter how well known, how famous, how good it is in its own tradition, in its own culture, if it is not circulating beyond its culture of origin, it's not lit uh, world literature. It's still a national, uh, a work of national literature. I think that makes sense. As a Chinese, I know there are so China has such a long history, but all these are only read by Chinese readers. Outside China, nobody or very few would know the great works of China. But the same is true with many, many other traditions. So that comes to another problem of world literature. That is, world literature we, are, we almost always discuss and uh, reflect in anthologies and, and textbooks, companions, and so on, are still very much the major literary traditions of Europe. You know, mostly English, French, German, some Spanish. Um, maybe 19th century, late 19th century Russian, and that is basically the same. Um, basically, that's what we uh, often discuss as work literature. You know, everybody knows, very important, very influential. But many other traditions, including China, including Brazil, including many other countries um, outside Europe, but even within Europe, the so-called minor literatures. You know, we don't know who is the greatest Roman, uh, uh, for example, um, in Romania, uh, who is the greatest poet of Romanian literature? Who is the greatest poet of Dutch literature? Who is the greatest of, uh, you know, uh, Scandinavian uh, literature? Of course, Scandinavian literature, we have, for example, Anderson from Danish, a great fairy tale writer. We know uh, Ibsen from Norway. Um, and, but, but these are very few, and they are famous not in their original. Ibsen became famous through German translation, and Anderson also from uh, translations in uh, English and French and many others. Uh, Metalink, uh, a Swedish playwright, was well known through his uh, French translation. So all these, but these so-called minor European traditions uh, and non-European traditions, traditions um, they also have great works, but those works remain basically known uh, in a very limited uh, readership. So I is very much interested. I'm very uh, very interested in uh, expanding the the idea of work literature and introduce great works from different literary traditions to join the canon of world literature. Um, I think I I am thinking of writing a book called the Yet Unknown World Literature because many of the great works yet unknown. You know I don't know. Uh, Many people don't know. I mean, what we know are the important works of Western tradition. Those are great works. I'm not saying they are not good. They are excellent works. I love read, you know, from Homer to, to Virgil, from Dante to Shakespeare, from Goethe to Wordsworth to, you know, even modern, more modern works, uh, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and many others. Uh, they are great works, but still they are part of the world literature. I think it should be. Well, literature should be much more than uh, just the major European traditions, and uh, we should have more works of literature. And therefore, we should we need scholars from different traditions to introduce the best works they know from their own tradition or from their own research. They're familiar with you know different traditions. For example, uh, you know Arabic literature. We all know One Thousand One Nights, but One Thousand One Nights actually was a combination uh, by European scholars putting different works together. It's not an original Arabic work. Um, and then 
you know, there are many others, uh, Persian, Iranian, Turkish, they all have great works, but we don't know. So I'm very interested in the idea of world literature that's yet unknown and needs to be discovered. And therefore, it's a lot of work, and it has to be an international collaboration, because I don't know those works, and we all know what we know in a limited uh, field of different national traditions or at most regional traditions. And uh, so we need collaboration of different scholars to work on the real idea of world literature. So basically this is what I think of comparative literature and world literature. And of course world literature, as I said, when Goethe talked about Vetter literature, he was reading Chinese novel in translation. And world literature has to consider literary translation as very, very important. Traditional comparative literature really ignores translation, or put down translation. As if you read translations, you're not a good comparatist. You have to read in the original. Well, that's fine. But then how many scholars, the greatest uh, European scholars, knows all languages, particularly beyond European languages? That's the critique uh, by, uh, for example, um, um, René Ejongle, a very good French comparatist. In the 1960s, he already attacked the idea of decoclutismus of uh, Metzel's idea. He said, it's all you know, you know, limited to the 10 European languages. But he said, uh, in many other non-European languages, and I mentioned Chinese, Sanskrit, Japanese, Tamir, and many others, he said, they already produced great works. Before the decoclutismus uh, literature existed, or even you know, uh, start to have their tradition. Uh, this is also what Goethe said. You know, when uh, Eckermann was asking Goethe, the Chinese novel he admired so much was, is that the, the greatest Chinese novel? Goethe said, no, 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 by no means. The Chinese had produced thousands of those novels uh, before, uh, before the Europeans. When our forefathers were still living in the woods, he said, <laughs> very famously. So I think that um, translation became very, very important. And what is translation and how do we, um, you know, translation studies has developed for many uh, years. But as I see it, translation studies um, are not very helpful to understand the literary translations, in fact. And not very helpful for the practice of translation. Because you think of um, Lawrence Benuti, uh, a famous person in translation studies, he emphasized foreignization. Uh, he, he, he discusses translation from post-colonial point of view. He says, he, uh, he argues translation is always appropriation. is a colonizer with a powerful position to asso assimilate the uh, colonized. But that's not, may not be always the case. I mean, in China, for example, there are thousand years of translation of Buddhist Bible, uh, uh, Buddhist sutras. It's not because the Chinese and the uh, Buddhists are uh, in different positions. You know, the Chinese uh, translating sutra not because the Chinese need uh, a religion or a superior kind of uh, re a religious system. It's not that. Um, and so the power relationship that uh, Venuti emphasized is very much a modern phenomenon. It doesn't apply to, you know, centuries ago. The first European to come to China, Marco Polo in the 13th century, was not coming to conquer, <laughs> but he came to China and was, you know, warned by what he saw, a country that didn't have a church, uh, but, you know, developed very, very well. And at that time, Chinese were already uh, using coal, uh, but in Europe, there is no coal, and uh, Marco Polo in his novels, and in his travel uh, travelogue, said the Chinese burn black stones. He didn't know that's coal. You know. uh, so many, many, uh, 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 particularly when you go uh, back in history, there are a lot of things which, is, which cannot be, and, and cannot be the same as in the framework of post-colonial post studies. So post-colonial studies is only 19th century and the 20th century, but the history of the world much, much longer. Um, so today, when you look at world literature studies, there are still some limitations. There's still this idea of Europe as center and the rest of the world as peripheries. Um, both Frank Moretti and particularly Pascal Casanova 
uh, use the world system theory, which um, have the center in Europe and the other as peripheries, which is very limiting. Particularly Pascal uh, Casanova's uh, book, she has what she called a historical analysis, and she and but her history began with European Renaissance in the 16th century. She didn't even talk about Greek Roman, uh, let alone other you know uh, different international literary space like the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the Ottoman Empire, and in East Asia, you have the what they call often called the Sinosphere. When Chinese language is not just used in China, but used in Japan, in Korea, in Vietnam, before in mid 19th century, uh, so all these were not in her purview of history, and that is still the influence. Uh, is still, uh, but her work is very very famous. Particularly now, it's translated into English and circulating very widely. Uh, had uh, you know also had critical acclaim, uh, but her view is very much uh, I would not say Eurocentric or even a dollar centric. It's Paris centric. <laughs> Basically, outside Paris is no culture, no literature, <laughs> uh, and I find that's very very limiting. So uh, we still have a lot of work to do, really, to study different literatures and to really expand the canon kind of world literature. Maybe this is what I want to say at the start, and uh, I hope we can have some discussion. Uh, and <coughs> I would love to answer any questions. Well, then let me begin by yeah. uh, asking you uh, something. I've heard you say before that uh, you thought the the very fact that David Damrush. Uh, decided uh, for having circulation as, let's say, his uh, main uh, idea uh, to, to include or not uh, uh, work in uh, world literature. Uh, you, 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 you thought that this was related to the American um, let's say the American academic life, mm -hmm. because there there were so many uh, things to be, to be taken into consideration. Uh, I mean, there's this may, there are many issues about political correctness mm -hmm. yes. and things like this uh, that uh, it was very suitable to find, uh, uh, let's say, a theoretical. Uh, a point of view that would not touch any of those hot issues yes. there. Yes. Uh, I would like you to, to uh, speak some more uh, mm. words about this. And there's another thing that uh, I would like to, to hear you uh, about, which is uh, uh, okay, uh, 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 I get that it's important uh, for us to take into consideration uh, the, all those uh, wonderful works that we love and, and that are considered canonical works, uh, Shakespeare, Dante, uh, Virgil, and so on. But uh, as you said, there is this uh, kind of um, Eurocentric way of building uh, this very canon that uh, does not take into consideration uh, many other works that are important in China uh, and uh, I wouldn't only say important because important may be important for national purposes but there are uh, let's say uh, also uh, an international level of quality but are not known because they were not translated or something like this. And there is this uh, remark by Roberto Fernandez Retamar, uh, this uh, famous uh, Cuban writer, he said, well, it's, and he's speaking about uh, uh, Latin America, uh, he said, well, it's not that we didn't have uh, great writers here. It is uh, that they they were not known uh, outside Latin America, yeah. and I, uh, <coughs> wouldn't you think there's something like this happening, or something like this happened in China, 
for instance, uh, meaning there are many great writers, Chinese writers, that just happen not to have been translated up to this moment, mm -hmm. and uh, that if they were, uh, uh, they would probably be considered uh, not as only national writers, national, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. uh, but also as international writers because of the quality. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the first question about David Amrush's definition of circulation, and, uh, you know, my understanding, indeed, I think David is not unaware of the problem, but given the academic situation in America, um, he probably couldn't talk about other ways of defining what is world literature. Um, I, of course, as I said, I worked in America for a very long time, I know this, but now I'm no longer in America, so in a way, and, you know, I, I feel... free. I'm, I'm free <laughs> not to speak my mind. But even if I were in America, I would be you know, not afraid to speak my mind. I often joke with my colleagues in America. I said I didn't even listen to Chairman Mao during the Cultural Revolution, so don't give me that crap. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I think circulation, as I said, is a good idea to at least uh, differentiate works that are read internationally from all the other works that are not translated and not circulating internationally. So that makes world literature at least manageable. Because if you include all the works, that's unmanageable. Um, and uh, Claudio Gian called it a wild idea. It's only uh, you know, a keeper of archives and also a millionaire could have a crazy idea of world literature as, as including everything. So in that sense, David's definition uh, makes work literature manageable. But circulation, I think, is not good enough as a definition of world literature. And many works, bestsellers, for example, they circulate in all the airport bookstores you can find. And also you can, you can have the New York Times you know, bestseller list, uh, or many other uh, journals publish bestseller list. But how many of those best-selling works will still be read you know, in five years, not to say longer. Many of the works are read and then are forgotten uh, because they are entertaining. Uh, they may have some uh, you know, quality, but, but they are not considered really great works. And when I say canonical great works, I mean works that have withstood the test of time. This is what Gadamer defines what he called them classical. He said, the classical is timeless, but timelessness is a mode of time. It sounds very paradoxical, but what he meant by this is that a great work, a classical work, has always sort of overcome the difference, the distance, the, the temporal difference between the work which is produced uh, before and the reader at the present. As, as he argues, every reading is a present reading. Is a fusion of horizons, mm -hmm. and he also uh, talked about the kind of uh, contemporaneity. You know, all reading is a reading of the contemporary. That is, we read a work; it's always related to ourselves. Every reader would have a different idea of the reading. This is the wonderful idea uh, uh, reflected in uh, uh, Borges' uh, crazy essay called. Pierre Minac, the author of Tan Quixote, right? He repeats Tan Quixote word by word, but still, he is the author of Tan Quixote. It doesn't make sense. But what I meant is that when Pierre Minac was reading Tan Quixote, he's not living in the time of Tan Quixote. Therefore, his reading, his understanding would be a different work, in a way. It's a reconstructed work. This is what Gardner's idea of fusion of horizons. The work has a fusion, and the reader has a different fusion. So really, the moment of understanding is neither to impose your subjective view uh, to, the, to, the, to the text, neither is to erase completely yourself to accept the works, the works horizon. It's impossible. You know, in 19th century hermeneutics, it seems to be want to be scientific and very you know, um, um, objective, so completely erase the idea of subjectivity. But Heidegger argues in being a time, you know, it's Dasein. We are all living in a particular time. Therefore, reading experience 
is always defined by the moment we are in history. So, in that sense, a classical work is a work that is both, you know, from the, uh, the past, but it's not the past, still relevant to us. So our classic work is always relevant to different generations of readers in different time under different conditions. So it's therefore it's not an idea of you know uh, in in particularly in uh, in uh, in America in a critique of canon. You know, canon is a conspiracy. It's a bunch of dead white males come together and decide what is canon. The, the situation is not that. You know, um, canon is a work that readers would come to read. Nobody would put a gun to my head, you must read Shakespeare, otherwise, you <laughs> know. So, the tremendous works, because they have their quality, they have their aesthetic value, uh, and have their cultural value. And many of the great works contain cultural values that are important for the tradition. So that's why they become classical. It's not because of political decision. Not Queen Elizabeth can decide Shakespeare become the canon, or anybody. So, um, so that's the idea that uh, circulation is not enough. It has to have aesthetic values, literary values, cultural values of the work for a tradition to become the classical, to become the canonical. Um, of course, literary canon is changeable. It's unlike the religious canon. It's not the Bible or the Quran you cannot change a word. It's already decided. But literary works, literary canon is changeable. Sometimes a author becomes very important uh, but then sometimes uh, his reputation would be less. You know, a good example of Lord Byron. Byron in 19th century was the English poet, much, much, you know, more influential and better known than any of the other Romantic poets. But now in 20th century, now we talk about English Romantics. You first talk about Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, and then maybe last you mentioned Byron. You know, Byron was not as important as before. So that, uh, you know says something about the change of time, canon also change with the time. Um, even, you know, Shakespeare was not, you know, always canonical. Uh, in his own time, he was criticized by Ben Johnson, uh, says that uh, he has small Latin and less Greek, he's not very well educated, he's not, you know, he doesn't obey the three unities, particularly from, from the French point of view. Uh, he's, he's uh, you know, for I call him uh, uh, a drunken savage, you know, a sauvage evil, <laughs> because he mixed the tragic and the comic together in one place, which is not allowed, and he doesn't obey the time uh, restriction, you know, you know his, and also the place. I mean, anyway, anyway, so it's very, very different. Um, so he became important, not just uh, throughout time, but also because of scholarship. So when this is related to the second question, many of the great works. Latin American or Chinese, uh, not because they're not translated. Even if they're translated, they may not be appreciated um, beyond their cultural origin. Because how to appreciate a work, sometimes, particularly a work that is very, very much you know, deeply ingrained in a particular tradition, a language and a cultural tradition, leads explanation to, you know, to appreciate. If you think of the great works of the Western major traditions, Shakespeare, another, and, you know, to, to make Shakespeare uh, as an example, we love Shakespeare not just because we read his plays, of course they're great, but because also we read a lot of criticism, a lot of scholarship. So translation is not enough. You must follow his scholarship to explain why this work is important, what the values of the work. Not only the literary aesthetic values, but the cultural values. Why is it important? Many of the great works now we think is very canonical, but in its own time uh, or short after, it's not. <coughs> Milton, for example, now of course it's very canonical in English tradition. In the 17th century, many people, including John Dryden, think Milton has failed in writing an epic. Because epic, if you think of the epic tradition from Homer to Virgil, you must have very uh, strong physical actions. You have war, basically, you know, in Trojan War. Or you have the adventures of Odysseus you know, from one place to another and meet with all kinds of strange beings and uh, uh, you know, monsters and so on. But, so it's a lot of action. 
a lot of things going on in the epic. But in Milton's Paradise Lost, no, nothing is going on. The one thing that's physical is Eve picked the apple in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> that's not much of that. But in what sense can be great? Milton's Paradise Lost is not justified by looking at the past epic tradition. Because he actually, when he was young, was a student in Cambridge, he was thinking of writing an epic, national epic, based on King Arthur and Round Table Knights. That would be more traditional, because King Arthur and Round Table Knights had a lot of you know, uh, fights and, 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 and physical action. But of course, he became a revolutionary. He you know, was, during the English Revolution, he defended the beheading of the king. He was not admiring of a monarch. He gave up his idea of writing about King Arthur, but chose the fall of man as his main subject. You know, he justified the ways of God to men. That's what he said he wanted to do. Uh, that, of course, made a very different epic. You know, for me, I, I, I love Milton. I think that's a great epic. Not because it's a physical action, but a lot of um, phys philosophical or metaphys metaphysical discussion of you know, the, the nature of good and evil. Why you know, God loves all of us. Why the world is so much misery and suffering. And that's a wonderful question, but you know, it's a perennial question to be discussed and, and Milton really gave a very, very good description using the biblical story to discuss those issues. Um, so all the great works have to be explained by scholarship to explain its value, why it is important, in order to be appreciated. So I think that, um, I would imagine, you know, I love all the great Chinese poets, but just translate them into English. I don't think it's going to be appreciated by readers who do not know the Chinese tradition because there are ways of reading those poems. Um, first of all, the poems are very short. Um, only you know the typical Chinese lu shi or regular verse only have eight lines, and every line has either five characters or seven characters at most. So it's very short. So in a way, almost like the sonnets in the European tradition. But how do you appreciate them? Why those poems are so important, as important, you would argue, as Homer or Shakespeare. You know, I have to argue why. Otherwise, people say, well, this little thing, you know, what is the brain that's about that? So you have to follow up with scholarship to explain the, the importance and the value of those works. I think it's true of all, you know, what I call the yet unknown works, you know, including uh, Latin American writers. Focus it's become, I think, part of world literature. But there's a lot of interpretation and explanation of his works, and that that helps to make him a world can a work in a, you know world literature can. But we do need to do this kind of work with other works as well. So not just uh, to to translate. Translate is the first step, but scholarship is even more important. So I uh, just. Not here before I uh, pose your question, just to remember, I forgot to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Usually here at Casa Giusi, we stop around 7.30, mm -hmm. we have a coffee outside, everybody then, we just have a little point. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you agree, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, but considering your incentivation and even your call to international collaboration about, among scholars in the field mm -hmm. to change the situation of just having blocks, side-by-side -side blocks, but having more integration and so on. And your constant call in your speech that there's a lot to be done, right? And again, incentivation, this uh, collaboration. Um, I would like to ask you, um, how do you see the role of Latin American literature in this scenery? Mm -hmm. Mainly if we consider the points in intercultural translation that you mentioned so uh, many times, not exactly like that, but I mean, well, uh, example, for example, you gave now of the Chinese poems, mm -hmm. how it's not just a matter of translating interlingually, but I mean, there's much more to do of understanding of a tradition, of a culture. So mainly considering scholars like uh, Edwin Gensler at Massachusetts Amherst, Mary D. Motsko, and all they've been writing, considering that translation is at the very basis of Latin American mm -hmm. 
uh, culture, because I mean, in fact, when <coughs> colonizers arrived, there was all matter of translation between the indigenous populations and the colonizers. The same happening in the process of slavery, right? When the enslaved people came in, also a whole translation. What could be done in this scenery with uh, names like Borges, that you mentioned the different times, Machado de Assis, uh, who, I mean, um, I agree with you, circulation is not enough, but I mean, we should consider cultural and literary values. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I think <coughs> both of them, I think, would have that. So, how do you see the, the situation of Latin American yeah. literature in this city? I think Latin American literature is not exactly unknown, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly people talk about magic realism okay. uh, as something very important from Latin America. Also, uh, Borges um, and several other Latin American writers um, from different countries in Latin America, uh, mostly Spanish-speaking uh, 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 writers. So, but I, I believe Latin America is a big, big continent and uh, very different, uh, many countries, different countries. Brazil is a very big one. Uh, Portuguese is a major language, um, even though the other um, countries are Spanish-speaking. Uh, so Latin America, I think, uh, even though we know uh, there are some workers, or, uh, some writers already well known, like Borges, uh, but I believe there are many more needs to be introduced. And then, of course, I personally, I don't know. So I don't know who would be um, really worthy of <coughs> translated and uh, also followed with scholarship to introduce into the world literature canon. So in that sense, I cannot answer the question because I simply don't know. But this is something we need, mm -hmm. you know, scholars in different countries in, uh, in Latin America. What, what I mean by this is that it cannot be imposed from the outside. It cannot be, for example, I would not, if, if, you, if I talk about Chinese literature, which I know very well, I would think these Chinese scholars, familiar with their own traditions, um, but ideally they can also write in good English, to introduce those writers to the world readership. I would not rely on sinologists in America or Europe even though some of them, I'm not saying they're not good, they can be very good, but they cannot, you know, replace the Chinese themselves. So I really have this problem of, for example, Spivak says, uh, whether the subordinates can speak. I believe the sub subordinates can speak and should speak. You cannot just replace them and by saying, I speak for you. Um, I think, uh, th therefore, in that sense, the works of world literature of different traditions should be uh, the canonical works are already decided by their own tradition because in every literary tradition there are already long tradition of criticism already um, decided or uh, come to some sort of consensus not necessarily absolute but already there is a sense of what are the important works in let's say Brazilian literature yeah. uh, obviously Masses is very important uh, but of course there may be also others uh, so you need people, you know, from Brazil, a good critic, not just one, but many, to work and introduce those works to the world, re you know, readership, okay. to argue for their global canonicity, not for the Brazilians. They already know who uh, these great writers. If you read, I, I actually am editing a book series called Canon and World Literature mm -hmm. for Margaret Macmillan. So I always ask people, invite people to write and uh, contribute to the book series and to write about authors and poets and writers I don't know. So even though I'm the book series editor, I know nothing about the books that are going to be written. But I always ask the authors for this book series, I said, you're not arguing for your own tradition. In other words, if you write about a Chinese uh, great work, you're not writing for the Chinese readers. Everybody knows that it's a great work. But you have to convince other people who don't know Chinese, who have even no interest in Chinese literature, why they should read this. Mm -hmm. This is a different question. And that is, needs to be done for Latin America and for other traditions as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
think about a bit about uh, Franco Moretti's and Pascal Casanova's mm -hmm. books and uh, works, which are, as you said, they are very important, so forth and so on. But I think they have a very li limited understanding of Manuel Wallerstein's concept, theory, of world system. Mm -hmm. They seem to understand the world system theory as being composed by few centers and a multiplication of peripheries. But actually, Wallerstein has done something very important, was introduced a third level, the same periphery. Say you have few centers, you have a, a larger number of same peripheries, and then a multiplication of peripheries. And perhaps if we think about world literature, we should, in, from our perspective, from the perspective of a Brazilian and of a Chinese, of non-hegemonic circumstances, we should stress the same periphery. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps would give us a very important outcome. Just one example. I could think of several, but just one example following what you have said, the example of Jorge Luis Borges. Mm -hmm. The reason why he became actually a, a name, a very active name in world literature, it was because from the 1930s, from the end of 1930s to the 1960s, Buenos Aires was a very important semi-periphery. It was peripheral regarding France, England, Germany, let's say, mm -hmm. but it was central <coughs> regarding the whole Hispanic world. Yes. And in Buenos Aires, yeah. there was someone, a very important promoter, called Victoria Ocampo, mm -hmm. and she brought to Buenos Aires yeah. simply everyone who was important at the time. Mm -hmm. Nobel Prizes, philosophers, thinkers, authors, and she brought to Buenos Aires Roger Caillois, a very important name in the French intellectual milieu the author of this very important theory of games mm -hmm. that was so fundamental for instance for, for Wolfgang Isen. Mm -hmm. Then Roger Caillois in Buenos Aires read Bor was introduced to Borges, was enchanted by Borges, and then promoted the translation of Borges in Paris. But not only the translation, but above all, Roger Caillois prepared the reception mm -hmm. of Borges' work in France. Mm -hmm. Then in 1966, Foucault writes the famous preface to Le Moyen de Chose, mm -hmm. saying that the, this book project was actually ignited by a smile mm -hmm. provoked by Jorge with Borges' short story. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Chinese Encyclopedia. Yes, the Chinese of Encyclopedia, which of course <laughs> has nothing to do with China. Of course. But has lots to do with <laughs> Borges' imagination. Yes. So, <coughs> I, I think that from our perspective, if we actually reconstruct the relationships of semi-peripheries that once were peripheral to Paris, Berlin, London, mm -hmm. but central to several places. Yes. Those semi-peripheral <coughs> spaces may be very important to <coughs> yet unknown world literature. Right now, actually, I'm, I'm asked to write an essay, uh, contribute to uh, his Oxford companion to world literature, and I, uh, I was asked to write about East Asia as a paradigm for comparative studies. And East Asia, of course, um, when you think in this you know, idea of center and periphery and same peripheries, East Asia would be another good example. Uh, historically, uh, East Asia, which means China, Japan, Korea, and also Vietnam, Vietnam even though it's South Asia, this is called often called a Sino-sphere. Why? Because uh, traditionally, historically, this whole region uh, has, was under the influence of China and Chinese culture. Not only that, the Chinese language was adopted by all these countries as the medium of communication or official communication. As early as 5th fifth, fifth century, um, Japan, that, at that time was not Japan, uh, but the, the people were called Wu or Wa in the for why in Chinese it's called war. Uh, the kings sent their uh, some ambassadors to come to at that time a Chinese uh, court, and they sent to the Chinese court some memorials, which was beautifully written in Chinese and completely recorded in Chinese history. So we have the textual evidence of those memorials, written probably not by Japanese themselves, but but by Koreans in service of Japanese, because Korea, Korea was closer to China there. Um, they adopted Chinese language much earlier. 
So uh, Korea has always been using Chinese until the early 20th century. Uh, Vietnam also used Chinese as an official language until the mid 19th century when Vietnam was colonized by the French. So the modern uh, Vietnamese uh, writing is basically made by the French and using Latin alphabet. So you can read, you know, uh, know how to pronounce it, basically like, like Latin with some diacritics. Uh, but before the 19th century, before the mid 19th century, Vietnam was uh, used use Chinese, literary Chinese. So Chinese was not just used by the Chinese people, but also by Japanese. Japanese, even today, still use a lot of Chinese characters uh, in their language. So not a, so it's a culturally related, but also in terms, in terms of the writing system, it's the same kind of connected world. So in that sense, that, uh, you, you can see East Asia as a culturally relatively coherent uh, entity. Uh, is with other parts of the world. So um, even though the idea of center and periphery in the work system theory has problems, but I think by and large, it still has a lot of explanatory power. Because it is a fact that in the last two centuries, I think, since the 19th century or late 18th century, Europe became, you know, uh, really the power of you know, the moving part in the world. Uh, and the colonization, uh, based on technology, industrialization, and so on, uh, modern Europe <coughs> certainly became uh, the major players in world history in the last 200 years. So in that sense, yes, center and periphery does make sense. Uh, it's limiting, because if you take this so literally, I mean, literary theory, uh, Franco Moretti, and particularly Casanova, I think are uh, very limiting in understanding the the, uh, the center and peripheries, and don't see the interaction of the periphery. Sometimes the periphery become very very important and entering the center, and this is always a problem, particularly for the French scholars. You know, a very important debate is so-called literature mondiale. Uh, uh, it's uh, I think I can't remember the exact date, but some years ago, most of the Francophone writers, not in France, but in other Francophone places, they got all the major prizes in France, in Paris. They got Goncourt and many other um, important prizes, and they got together and published a manifesto in Le Monde, which is a major French newspaper, talking about a uh, world literature, you know, literature monde, uh, de monde, uh, in French. And what is interesting is that. Uh, that got many uh, French, you know, really French French writers quite, quite nervous. And it's none other than Sarkozy himself mm, <laughs> published an essay defending the idea of uh, Francophonie and said Francophonie is okay because the French Francophone writers don't want to have Francophonie. They want to become just French writers. So they want to, def you know, sort of get rid of the, the center and periphery. Don't, don't want to call themselves francophone writers, but just French writers writing in French. But Sarkozy was trying to keep them in francophony. <laughs> so you can see that's very, very interesting for the French. Uh, it, it's it's a, it's an idea that is. That's why you can see that uh, I think uh, Casanova's book was intentionally intended to be read by French writers, the readers, not really written for others. But now. Uh, with the English translation circulating everywhere, that book becomes a problem because a lot of people are attacking her for not only Eurocentric but really Paris-centric ideas. Okay. Yeah, so that's the problem. But I agree that semi-periphery uh, uh, it's important. Uh, talking about Wallenstein's ideas, uh, he has a little book really explaining the essence of the word theory, uh, word system theory. And I, I read that book, I find it also it's somewhat problematic in the sense that he is talking about, for example, sovereignty, the, the concept of sovereignty. He talked about the concept of sovereignty for a nation state, which is very important for that, is something that is born in the 17th, 16th, 17th century. And that became a problem. Why? Because uh, well, for Europe, 
that might be the, the case mm -hmm. because uh, he basically uh, derived his his, uh, his theory from a very careful study of European history. So of course we know the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and the modern time. That's fine. But to call that a world system becomes a problem. Because sovereignty, the idea that you have a major, con con what is sovereignty? That you have control of your territories. You know, this is very important. You have borders. You, know, you have a sense of what you can control as the as, as idea of sovereignty. Now, for example, we all have passports. When you go to a different country, you have to have visa, you have to go through the customs. That is what sovereignty means. You know. But if he defines sovereignty only in the 17th century, then many people will ask, for example, I have written a very long essay defending this idea that China was a country before 17th century. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the Chinese, of course, very, very long history, and that history is different from, from the European. Uh, so in 17th century, so far as China is concerned, 17th century is very recent. It's not ancient at all. When we talk about ancient, we mean 3,000 years ago. That was ancient. <laughs> For 17th century is already the beginning of Qin Dynasty, the very last imperial dynasty in China. We have, first we have Qin, the first uh, dynasty we have Han. Great dynasty. We have, you know, skipping some of the smaller ones. You have Han, you have <coughs> Tang dynasty, a very important one. That's golden time for Chinese poetry. You have Song dynasty, 11th century to 13th century. And you have Yuan dynasty, 13th century. That's where, you know, Marco Polo came to China because Mongols had hit up everybody and made <laughs> the Eurasian continent uh, one entity you can go through. Otherwise, you know, Europeans couldn't come to China because it's blocked by the Arabic countries in the middle. So even though they have many crusades, but uh, they couldn't really uh, completely wipe out the, uh, the Muslims. But Mongols, it's not wiped out, but conquered everybody. So beat up not only Chinese, but also all the so east from Siberia and west to Hungary. The whole uh, land mass was controlled by the Mongols. That's why uh, in 13th century, not before, that a European like Marco Polo could come to China. And uh, he came to China, and in, that was the time of Kublai Khan, the uh, grandson of Genghis mm -hmm. Khan, uh, became the emperor of the Yuan dynasty in China. Mm -hmm. That's that's Marco Polo's book is all about. Uh, so it's very interesting. I mean, uh, you can see this in the sort of really global history in that context. You can understand. When you talked about tr uh, translation, I thought I think about the Andalusia uh, Renaissance. Huh? The Renaissance, the Renaissance in, yes. yeah, in, in Spain, yeah, in Portugal, <laughs> yeah. and there you had uh, the 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 Catholics, the uh, Jews, mm -hmm. and the uh, Arabic, Arabic mm -hmm. translating each other, uh, yeah. they had over with each other, mm -hmm. and uh, a great part of the the classical cu culture that make the European Renaissance to, uh, after, mm -hmm. the Italian Renaissance, came from a uh, translation from the Arabic. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the Arab world uh, pre preserved, pre preserved. preserved most of this classical culture. Mm -hmm. uh, now you see the, the Arabic world like uh, some lower, some not, not so good, mm -hmm. but uh, it was maybe more important than, than the Catholic Church to preserve the tradition, to make the translations, <coughs> and to link this ancient uh, Occidental culture to our, our modern culture. Yes. So I think yes. Yeah. when you talk now uh, about China and uh, these other countries, I think you have to make a, like a new renaissance. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think this this the same kind of the same uh, kind of work. <coughs> yes, uh, that's true. I mean, the uh, European Renaissance. Uh, even though we usually talk about Renaissance as 15th century, uh, 16th century in Italy in particular, but actually the 13th century was very important. Right. 13th century was the time when Aristotle was rediscovered, mainly. 
precisely through Arabic commentators. Averro is very famous uh, in Arabic uh, scholarship. He commented on many of the uh, important works by Aristotle and it was rediscovered or retranslated into European languages in Latin. And so therefore, uh, for example, the important work, uh, very important for uh, uh, history of ideas, was uh, Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, mm -hmm. which became really a compromise of the rationalist philosophy or Aristotle's rational philosophy and the Catholic uh, theology, the doctrine of Christianity, because these two are in conflict. But the reintroduction of Aristotle in Europe became a very big challenge to the church, and Thomas Aquinas was really an important figure to combine or make compromise in the works. Therefore, uh, Summa Theologica became one of the major works that was very important for the Renaissance humanists. You know, Dante's Commedia, Marco Polo's Travel, and Theologica, uh, Summa Theologica are the three major works that all the humanists in Renaissance are reading, a very important works. And that, of course, has a lot to do with uh, the um, you know, preservation of the classics. When Aristotle was completely forgotten during the Middle Ages in Europe, it was very much uh, commented on by Arabic scholars, even though the commentary coming from a different culture and perspective may not be really getting the real ideas of, of some of Aristotle's ideas. For example, <coughs> a, very, a various commentary on uh, Aristotle's poetics. He didn't even have a concept of tragic and comic. He had a concept of praise and satire. He thought the tragic is the praise of something and relate the tragic with the praise and relate the comic with satire. It's really hard to understand, but it has to be understood in the Arabic uh, sort of value system because in Arabic tradition, to praise is always important. And so poetry has two functions, to praise or to satire, to satirize. And he relates this to Aristotle's idea of tragedy and comedy, which is, <laughs> of course, very different, but it's important. So yes, uh, you're right that if we go back to history. It's very important to go back to history. Otherwise, we cannot have a complete picture. Much of the problem, I think, is that we have too much concentration on the model without really understanding of the history of things. This is true of not only uh, of um, uh, modern literature, but even uh, history and philosophy, everything. Uh, we have to have a, a better uh, understanding of history. And when you understand history, then, Many of the ideas we as we accept as almost you know unquestionable, uh, always we don't question those notions become problematic. So the idea that uh, Europe is always the center, the rest is always barbaric, that is not true. Uh, it's, it's impossible to to read uh, uh, any literature book uh, without history. Uh, yeah, you, you read it so. You are reading a fair, a fair tale, not a, a, That's right. a novel. Yeah, of course. To understand any work uh, really deeply, you really need to put it in a historical perspective. In, in, to us, it's very uh, difficult sometimes to, to study the, the China history. It's very, it's very, very difficult mm -hmm. to, yes. to find some, some good things about it. Uh, maybe you have some something uh, that the French school of, of uh, historians made, but it's a little, little things. Mm -hmm. You have very, very little, and there, there is a Schiller Institute in, in Germany mm -hmm. that makes some very good work about the China history. Uh, a guy named Michael Billington and another, another person. But uh, some, uh, uh, there, uh, there are some. Uh, some is is inside. Some inside. Some some inside. Uh, Forty, fifty pages only. A lot of them, ten, uh, fifteen, and so and finish. And they talk about the uh, the Confucius tradition in the West. Some uh, linked about the Socrates tradition, the Plato tradition, and the Confucius tradition. 
Yes. Is this the overall idea of them? <coughs> it's good. Now some 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 some, uh, some things is good. Some 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 of these things is very good, but it's very little. I think it's yes. Yeah. Again, if you um, go back to history, China, of course, in modern time, particularly in, uh, China, lost in Opium War, um, defeated by British. And then, of course, suffered a lot in the 20th century. Japan also occupied much of China. Uh, and then, um, you know, so China was very poor, very weak country uh, in much of the time of the 20th century. Uh, it's, it's only in the last 40 years or so, China had, had reform and opening up and became you know, the second largest economy in the world, which was surprising for even the Chinese themselves. Mm -hmm. But anyway, if you think of history then, when the Jesuit missionaries came to China in the late 16th and early 17th century, the picture of the world was completely different. Because Chinese society at that time, after the Song Dynasty um, and uh, even the end of Ming Dynasty at that time, was still very, very developed compared with Europe at that time. Mm -hmm. So missionaries came to China and they found two things which were astonishing for Europeans, particularly for European Enlightenment philosophers. So you find Voltaire and Leibniz, the two great philosophers of Europe, admiring Confucius, admiring China. Why? Because this has also to be understood in the global historical perspective. Because after the Renaissance and Reformation, the after the 30 years of religious war, Europe, the population of Europe was wiped out a lot uh, by religious conflict between the Catholics and Protestants. And therefore, uh, in the age of reason, what we call the 18th century, philosophers were trying to find a way to get out of the shadow of the church. Voltaire was very anti-Catholic, even though he was uh, French and Catholic. Uh, he wanted to have a sec secular society built on bon sang, not really based on faith. And therefore, when the Jesuits came to China, they found China, one thing they found in China is very different. Is China didn't have a church, still doesn't, <laughs> even today. So Chinese never put religion as the top of priorities, which is very different from Europe. So this is one thing that, that's exactly what Voltaire wanted to establish in Europe as a modern country. Because we know the first principle of a modern state is separation of church and state. Church takes care of spiritual life, but the government, uh, the transactions of the government of business should be secular, should not be controlled by the church. So it's very different from, from medieval times. Medieval times, kings, secular kings, must be sanctioned by the pope, otherwise they cannot be king. You know? And we know that the French uh, uh, King Charles V appointed his own bishops, that was a big problem. He had to ask the Pope for forgiveness, and according to history, he kneeled in snow for three days, which cannot be true. I mean, three days, he must be frozen to death. But he must have kneeled in front of the Pope's residence for a long time, until the Pope finally forgave him. This couldn't possibly happen in China. No Buddhist monk or anybody could you know, say something that the king you know, or emperor uh, ask for forgiveness is impossible. In China, uh, religion, of course, they have religion. You know, Buddhism, uh, Taoism, they all have all popular religion, but religion was never as high as politics. So the emperor's power was not challenged. And this is something that um, Voltaire was really dreaming of. So they all think that this is something that they want to have this separation of church and state, and China didn't have a church, and the society was very well managed and very affluent. This is one thing they admire. The other thing, important for European intellectuals, and particularly for intellectuals, was the Chinese civil examination system. Because in China, uh, the way to recruit ruling elites to appoint you know, officials in different offices become a magistrate. Was not based on the aristocratic lineage of kingship. And that was what Europeans were doing. So you have to be born a duke to become a duke. You may be a very stupid person, but you are a duke. 
you'll be respected. <laughs> and you may be very smart, a very good intellectual, but you're not nobody because you're not aristocracy. It's not in the, um, you know, a family from uh, aristocratic family. But in China, it's different. China, from the Sui Dynasty in the seventh, uh, sixth century, and particularly in Tang Dynasty established in seventh century, already have this different levels of civic, uh, civil examination system. And the exams, that is, all scholars, if you read Confucian classics, because the exams was based on Confucian classics, if you read classics, the Confucian canon, if you can pass the different levels of exam examinations, if you can pass the highest level of civic examination, you immediately become an official. You'll be appointed to an office. You become a magistrate. You become a ruler. Yeah. So that was astonishing for the Europeans. So they all think this is the realization of Plato's dream of philosopher the king. Because Plato said, you know, and he realized this. He said, if I articulate the idea that philosophers should be kings and kings should be philosophers, I must be carried away by the waves of laughter and ridicule. But in China, that's, that's a reality. The idea that those who rule should have knowledge is accepted because Confucius was a teacher. And therefore, the idea of education of knowledge became very, very deeply ingrained in Chinese culture as a basic cultural value. You know. So scholar is always respected. And a military, a, a martial art, even though there are martial arts, <laughs> Kung Fu movies, very attractive, was never you know, considered important. If you're a good person, you should study, read Confucian classics, and they become part of the ruling elites. And that was something that is unheard of in Europe. For, you know, for I was very, very impressed by that. Uh, when a French um, uh, uh, historian wrote a history of the world without China, uh, Voltaire was very, very angry. He said, how can you talk about world history without China? Therefore, so he wrote the uh, Essai sur le Mort, which began by talking about China and so on. So it's very, very interesting to see. So in a, in a historical perspective, perspective, you see things very differently from the contemporary or last 100, 200 years. Uh, so I, I think that's very important, to have a history, to have a sense of history. <coughs> when, when you talk like this uh, about the, the long history, the long China history, uh, appears to me the, the dialogue uh, between Solon and the Egypt, Egyptian uh, sacerdote, Priest, yeah, priest. yeah, yeah, the Egyptian uh, priest in the Timaeus dialogue. And uh, Solomon goes to, to, to Egypt, and uh, the, the priest call, uh, tell, tell to him, call to him, uh, No, uh, you, you are Greek, you think you, you have a great history, but you, you are a child. We can, we, the Egyptians can teach you, not you can teach me. But there's a guy in Portugal in 16th, uh, 16th century uh, called uh, João de Barros that describes a lot, uh, wrote a lot about the, the Chinese uh, uh, during the, the Portuguese expansion, maritime expansion. I don't know that, uh, and, they, uh, and, and he uh, talked very well, very, very good about the, the Chinese. I don't know that, that uh, I don't know that uh, that's that they have some Chinese traveler that talks about the the the, ocean, the, the West, about the West. Yes, well, the, the, this Chinese vision long, about uh, the West. Contact with China, and Macau is a good example still. Mm. You know, Macau was uh, related to Portugal and and uh, uh, no, became a much longer history than Hong Kong, for example. So Macau is yeah uh, a lot of Portuguese influence. Yes. I was thinking about the, the example that you quoted before about the Frank Company and discussion in the Gung Book Prize. Mm -hmm. And I remember about the World Cup that recently yes. has finished. Mm -hmm. And a major discussion has appeared because one uh, American comedian that is actually was born in South Africa, 
said that uh, who won the World Cup was the Africans. And that generated not uh, only a debate inside the US, but uh, one of the, the diplomats from France has uh, written a letter to discuss with this community. Uh -huh. And that reminded me about uh, some other issue that is this uh, immigration coming from the Arabic countries and also from Africa to uh, Europe and is already the biggest uh, major as far as population as numbers and uh, immigration movement in the 20th century. So I was thinking about that and the relation of this means of transmission and this cultural interaction. How do you see that uh, in a perspective? Because it, we have already an editorial movement um, concerned with the translation of several uh, Arabic literature as far as Europe and even in Brazil we have different kinds uh, of motivations that put uh, a start to that for instance in Brazil we have um, one publishing house that has edited uh, Japanese literature for the last 10 years mm -hmm. and we have no political uh, motivation for that but we, have, we see already several students com uh, involved with that kind of literature also. How do you see uh, this political point, this turning point? Because we can see the, how can I say, the, some kind of, of a fight between uh, two different uh, philosophical systems and perhaps also cultural uh, uh Of course, the uh, teams of World Cup teams are all national teams. Uh, have to be a citizen of a state or country. Uh, and in the sense that many uh, African uh, ori originally come from Africa, Africa, but they may be born in Germany or Belgium, whatever country, then become a member of the national team. So in that sense, it's you know, a problem of how do you identify people, uh, whether they are you know, second generation uh, was, was third generation of immigrants are still identified as Africans or rather than uh, whatever national team they are. They are. So I, I, this reminds me of, of a very important book written by Amartya Sen. I don't know whether you know Amartya Sen. His uh, economy, uh, economist uh, got the Nobel Prize for Economy, but he's a very good um, scholar and public intellectual, very good writer. Uh, he wrote a book called Identity and violence. He argues we all have multiple identities, each of us. You know, different occasions, we assume different identities. For example, uh, when I'm speaking here, I'm a lecturer, I'm a speaker. But when I go home, I become the husband of my wife, fa father of my children. You cannot say the same identity, right? They're all very different, in different social and uh, uh, a cultural conditions for different occasions, you always have different identities. <coughs> but if you all only think one identity, <coughs> particularly national identity, a religious identity, think of yourself as a Christian, not only a Christian, a Catholic or a Protestant, um, a Lutheran or some other you know, I mean, denomination, or a Muslim or a Buddhist, and if you think that is the most important identity then, you become very narrow-minded and very dangerous. And many of the problems, violence, happen precisely because of this kind of identification with a particular you know, community uh, which tends to be conflictory and creates a lot of problems. I think there's a wonderful book about precisely this idea. So immigration, of course, particularly in recent years, becomes a very hard issue in Europe and in other places, and particularly also related with religion. You know, Muslims mostly uh, going to Europe and uh, yeah, traditionally the community of Christian community and uh, how you have all this conflict. I still remember, for example, uh, this is a year, three, two or three years ago, uh, I was in Germany um, and during Christmas uh, time, you all, you must have all heard of this, in Cologne, uh, a, a lot of women were um, molested, if not raped, by a thousand people mm -hmm. organized, and most of them Muslims. So that creates a big problem in Germany. 
Germany was the most open in European countries. Merkel was welcoming all the immigrants. But you do have this problem. Uh, so that, of course, um, gets a lot of attention and reported worldwide everywhere. And I was in Germany. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I experienced that. Uh, <clears throat> so I can understand the tension created by issues like this. Uh, of course, that somehow, really, you know, very far from what we're talking about comparative world literature. But I, I do think, uh, you know, the idea, ideas of, uh, of literature in particular, I think, is a civilizing force. If we all try to read each other's literary works, appreciate different cultures, then the tension would be much, much less. I think we live in a world with so much conflict and, and, and even war is precisely because we lack that kind of cross-cultural understanding. Mm -hmm. We always think Muslims must be a you know, suicide bomber or something, <laughs> and which is, cannot be true. You know, there must be a lot of good Muslims. But of course, there are the bad ones. There are terrorists. That also is a fact. So it's very complicated. But indeed, I think if we have more cross-cultural cross understanding, of different cultures, religions, traditions, even if we may not dis agree with everything, you know, with each other, but we can at least coexist and live, you know, uh, harmoniously in, in a society. Uh, I think, therefore, I, I always believe the study, what we do is very scholarly, very academic. You know, we do academic work, study different literatures and so on. But I do think it's relevant to our life, to our world. If we really promote the understanding of different literatures and cultures, then the world would become a better place to live. This kind of balance would be reduced. I was thinking specifically about the, the, the possibility of the broader translation process mm -hmm. from uh, especially Islamic literature to you. Mm -hmm. And how can that affect the, this kind of work of, with the canon also, yeah. because the, this humanistic value, of course, is, is, is one of the literature's most valuable ones, mm -hmm. too. But I, I was thinking about how how this movement, this political movement, can have an effect in this process of translation in the setting <coughs> of... Yes, there are pro uh, now there are many authors they become bilingual or, you know, writing in a different language. Um, because I was teaching uh, uh, seminars just before I came to Brazil. Uh, earlier this month, well, it should be still, we're still in, oh no, we are now in August. In July, <laughs> in July I was in Tokyo uh, teaching two weeks of seminar in, uh, Harvard University has a summer program called uh, um, uh, Institute for World Literature. So I was teaching in Tokyo. And in Tokyo, uh, there was one lecture given by a Japanese writer. Uh, I can't remember her name, a uh, very famous one. She's Japanese, and she now lives in Germany also. She wrote her works in German. Uh, very interesting work. Um, so there are writers like this. There are immigrant writers, but they write in different languages. So it's very difficult to categorize them whether she is Japanese writer or German writer. Uh, <coughs> so, with this immigration, with this movement of people in the world today, we live in, as I said, we live in a very globalized world. And uh, there are so much more connectedness. Uh, so the traditional identity become more and more difficult. Yeah. So, um, related to earlier, we were talking about the Francophone writers and French writers. Also, it's the same uh, uh, phenomenon. <coughs> people who are not French, not French, French citizens, but they write in French, or not British citizens, but writing in English. There are many, many uh, writers like this. Um, so it's, uh, as, so in that sense then, the identification, a national identity is less important. It's also pro problematic. So we should think of them as just, you know, writers writing in different languages. Um, but whether those works, this is very con contemporary phenomenon. Uh, we don't have many writers like that. Of course, in traditional 
canon, you also have writers like that. For example, Joseph Conrad is certainly a, a, a very important canonical writer in English literature, but he's Polish, it's not English. Yeah. And Nabokov, a Russian, there are many others. Yeah, yeah, there are many others. But contemporary, this, but in, in particularly today, I think in contemporary world, uh, immigration is large scale, and therefore writers and, and works written in different languages become more. Uh, <coughs> how those works can become part of world literature or even canon of world literature is a difficult question because uh, in my understanding, as I talked about earlier, a canonical work or classical work is a work that has withstood the test of time. So it's very difficult to say contemporary works produced in the past few years, which of them can be really a work classic uh, in the future. Um, you know, I'm thinking, for example, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, <laughs> which is very, very popular, translated into all languages, and she became so rich that she's richer than the queen now. Uh, whether that work will become world classic, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, you cannot say uh, it doesn't have value. It does. I mean, the, the whole work uh, is really a very progressive idea because the critique of the the pure bloods, you know, the bad guys are always ones who are really um, pure, pure um, uh, witches or, or, or wizards, and the uh, the other, the hard part of himself and uh, Hermione, the girl, we all like very much a uh, mixed blood because they're not really born by uh, wizards. <laughs> the parents are humans and so on. So this is an idea that is very different from earlier works. So in that sense, that work really is pr promoting the idea of crit criticizing the pure blood idea, the sort of pure race idea, which of course is what the Nazis are all about. The Aryan race must be pure and so on. Uh, so it's very, very nice, uh, 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 very good ideas in the, in the book, in addition to its wonderful stories. But whether this book will you know, survive you know, the test of time, because we, we have to say people's taste is very uh, unstable. <laughs> Readers always try to try new things. So after 10 years, after 100 years, whether that work will still be uh, a great work read by many. Uh, this is something is certainly unknown. We don't have an answer to it. Regarding so, oh. uh, the influence of European or American literature in China, mm -hmm. how much of uh, Western writers are really read or at least accessible in China? In China, I must say, uh, many, many writers um, I can say almost all the canonical works in the Western tradition, from Homer to Virgil to Dante to Shakespeare to contemporary works, James Joyce, even though it's very, very difficult, uh, you know, um, <coughs> they're all translated into Chinese. So Chinese read a lot of foreign literature. A lot of works were uh, are translated into Chinese. So I, I think this is what I often call a kind of imbalance of power because the West is a predominant influence. The non-West is the receiving end of the power, therefore creates an imbalance of knowledge, imbalance of power. In, uh, what I mean is, for example, a China, the average Chinese college student, a student who is a university student, not necessarily majoring in, in, in literature, would we'll certainly have known, at least heard of, the names of Plato, Aristotle, you know, Shakespeare, and all these great names. It's impossible for a Chinese college student to have never heard of this. If he or she have never heard of this, he or she would be very ashamed, would we'll probably not get into a university. But, on the other hand, if you go to America or Europe, <coughs> An average college student from America or Europe would have never heard of the great names of Chinese poets and writers or none idea of that. So that's what I call the imbalance. The imbalance needs to be addressed. Yeah. But then, of course, we in the peripheries actually know more. If you believe Francis Bacon says knowledge is power, then you know, we have more power than people who don't believe. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.